Okay, let me do it for you. I'll do a little short one. This is Melinda Thompson. She's been so, uh, she's been really pro prolific l lately. I want her to talk about some of her other projects that she's working on, but she's written a full length a collection um, called Amateur that's going to be coming out in a, a soon. And she has an honorable mentor in 2019, Lena Show Book Award with the North Carolina Courses Society. And, um, and that is coming forthcoming also in Hermit Feathers Press. She's the author of two chapbooks with Finishing uh, Line Press. Her recent award-winning poems include 2019 Pushcart nomination and first place in the 2019 Robert Golden Poetry Contest. Her poems have appeared in Pine Song, Stone Coast Review, Tar River Poetry, the Comstock Review, and the North Carolina Literary Review, among many, many others. She's been writing for quite a while, so I just mentioned some of her latest work. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so happy to have her today. Take oh. it away, Melissa. <laughs> We've got an um, a clock here from 1860, and it 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 bang, I mean, it really rings the time, and I just was like, oh my gosh, the clock is ringing. So, um, so thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really really happy to be with you all. Um, I named this session Departure Points, Our Literary Influences, because when we credit our favorite poets for influencing our writer, our writing, it seems to make them more alive. And I'm sure you've done the same thing um, with your favorite authors, like read everything they've written, including their letters, searched out every biography, and PBS program about them. So by doing that, these authors seem to move from inspiration to almost being our real friends. And my pals include Emily Dickinson, Jane Austen, Elizabeth Bishop, and Bill Matthews. Um, last year after Hermit Feathers Press accepted my honorable mention Lena Scholl Poetry Contest manuscript, Armature, for publication, yay, um, I decided to set up my website. And I had never felt I needed a website before because although my poems were being published in journals and I had two chapbooks, I wasn't sure if I would ever see a full length collection. In fact, I had resigned myself to the idea that I would leave a collection of fascicles in my cedar chest a la Emily Dickinson. So I want to walk you through how I selected my four influences. And so I'll read a bit from the Jane Austen post on my website's musings page. It used to be called the blog, but blog sort of freaked me out because I knew I had to keep blogging and I got nervous and I changed the whole thing. And I was like, okay, these are musings. Musings are less <laughs> intimidating for me. So, and this um, pretty much will sum up why I find solace in these writers. Jane Austen, Emily Dickinson, and Elizabeth Bishop reflect different facets of my writing, creativity, background, and values, which I've learned to not only accept, but even celebrate. I now see myself less as the odd one out because of discovering and getting to know these three writers. Ever since graduate school, I have kept lists of books I have read. This started with a goal of reading 50 books a year to immerse myself in the literature that my teacher, Bill Matthews, spoke about in class. These lists help me remember my literary friends too. I must say my favorite sister is Jane Austen whose novels I've read at least 50 times in the past 20 years, including over 33 times since 2017. Um, the Jesuit priest George Anderson refers to this as, quote, comfort reading in his article of many things in the September 2003 issue of America, a Jesuit magazine. He says he noticed many subway riders doing comfort reading in Manhattan, even those standing with their free hand gripped to a pole. 
He compared this kind of reading to comfort food. His comfort reading was the mill and the floss. For me, Austin's novels are my comfort food. They feed my soul with nutrients, not empty junk food calories. I read her novels repeatedly in order to relax with my friends who live within her well-crafted dialogues and plots. Austin's character development, humor, and pacing fascinate me. So does her problem-solving thoughtfulness. Since 1998, each reading has offered me fresh views on Austin's characterization, geographical locations, writing techniques, and plot strategies. I not only read about my influences, but I also watch movies and programs on them. In Julia Harris's The Bell of Amherst, a memorable quote of Dickinson's she uses is phosphorescence. Now that's a word to lift your hat to, to find that phosphorescence, that light within. That's the genius behind poetry. In my favorite episode of season one of PBS's Poetry in America, Elisa New, Cynthia Nixon, Yo-Yo Ma, and Marie Howe discuss Emily Dickinson's poem, I Cannot Dance Upon My Toes. When I first watched that episode, I was struck how Emily Dickinson's poem attracted people from different walks of life. It was almost like her community outreach that delighted me. This segment opens by addressing the tensions between the personal nature of poetry and writing for a larger audience. Here's uh, the first four minutes of the episode, I Cannot Dance Upon My Toes. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and make sure I get, so it'll be about four. I need to make sure that you hear it through my sound. Okay. published seven eleven i cannot recall and no more and no more still ah uh, to be racked by success arguably the central conceit of emily dickinson's life is the tension between the private and the public the interior and the world itself and her struggle with the idea of publication and fame and a yearning for it too. She's not saying something about dance. Is it about dance? Yeah, maybe a little bit, yeah, sure. But the thing that we have in common between music and poetry or any other art form is that you're trying to go from the specific to the universal. She dances all through the poem. I mean, that's Emily for you. She says, I can't, I can't, I couldn't, me? As she does it. I mean, she's always saying, I can't, but if I could, then I'd do it like this. I cannot dance upon my toes. No man instructed me, but oftentimes among my mind, a glee possesseth me that had I ballet knowledge would put itself abroad in pirouette to blanch a troop or lay a prima mad. And though I had no gown of gauze, no ringlet to my hair, nor hop to audiences like birds one claw upon the air, nor tossed my shape in eider balls, nor rolled on wheels of snow till I was out of sight 
in sound the house encore me so. Nor any know I know the art I mention easy here. Nor any placard boast me. It's full as opera. Her poetry was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. A woman had never written like this. The intensity, the desire in it. Poetry of the day was strictly rhymed, conventional in diction, and the themes deemed appropriate for women were often limited to flowers, love of children, and deathbed sorrow. Emily Dickinson surely knows her poetry is unusual when she writes to the prominent literary critic Thomas Wentworth Higginson. She sends him poems, writes a letter to him that is a poem, right, asking yes. him if these verses breathe. You know, he had many criticisms of her, including her bizarre syntax and her her meter, and he had many odd things. Odd punctuation. Her odd punctuation, many things that he wished were more standard and more traditional. So he writes her back and says, I advise you not to publish. Dickinson. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, make sure I'll, I'll stop the share. There we go. Um, so, um, so what I found, like I can connect with Emily, was that desire, that internal dis conflict, with the desire for an audience. Okay, so um, for myself, I first became aware of being part of a larger community after Bill Matthews' death in 1997. My friends Kurt Brown, Esther Weiner, Meg Carney, and Donna Reese edited an anthology celebrating Bill as a teacher, friend, and poet. When I read Phil Miller's review of Blues for Bill, this is this is this the book here. You uh, so um, when I read Phil Miller's review of Blues for Bill, I suddenly became aware of my, his, my historical role as a writer. Miller starts the review with the following. What could be more extraordinary about the anthology Blues for Bill, a tribute to William Matthews, are its triple pleasures and purposes. It is an anthology of uncommonly good poetry a near encyclopedia of strong, turn of the century poetic styles, and an unusually well chosen collection of poems about poetry, about the writing and teaching of poetry, the poetry community, and particularly about one very original poet and teacher of poetry, William Matthews himself. When I first read this review, I was stunned by Miller's use of the phrase, turn of the century poets. And later in the review, I felt the weight of this responsibility when Miller identified a section of my poem that includes a list of Matthew's vocabulary by his saying, quote, we get even closer to Matthew's and his art in Melinda Thompson's Ode to Bill Matthews Vocabulary, 1997. This was a pretty heady experience for me. The idea of writing within a historical context had never occurred to me before. I thought that was left for historians and certainly would not include me. Since that time, living through 9-11 in New York City, and now during racial conflict, a pandemic and political insurrection, I see that the response to these events are not just important to my own understanding of what they mean, but also it is basically a civic responsibility to leave a firsthand account of life during these times. My writing, as does yours, occupies two orbits the personal and historical. If you haven't thought about the historical realm your poems live in, let me show you a visual example of how three questions can help you reflect on your literary influences. 
I hope these slides show you what I mean. At the end of the presentation, um, we can open up breakout rooms so you can share your own influences with three or four other participants. And then we can return to the main room and sort of share our ideas as a group. So we'll, now, now I have a PowerPoint. I know, I know that's exciting, right? <laughs> So hold on, let's see. I'll get this PowerPoint going. So here are some questions that I thought about as I'm thinking about what makes me the poet that I am. Um, why do I keep returning to this particular poet? You know, so Emily Dickinson and um Bill Matthews and Elizabeth Bishop, and and also uh, you know I'd include the novel I include a novelist Jane Austen. What do our biographies have in common? What was happening historically during that writer's lifetime, and why do those events resonate with me? What do I specifically love about this writer's poetry, and what? And what is a significant poem or line from this poet that guides my life? I mean, these poets are ones that really shape who you are, you know? So I want you to sort of consider that, that final question, the significant poem or line. Let's see, whoops. So now I'm gonna go through um, the the different writers here, and I'll just kind of draw your attention to what, what I, what I, why I connect to them. Um, so Jane Austen, I really admire her wit and her humor. I mean, just think of the opening sentence of Pride and Prejudice. It's a truth universally acknowledged. Um, that that opening line is just so witty when she's sitting there oh yeah a rich man oh yes he must be in want of a wife you know if he's a single rich man you, he wants that wife um the other thing she elevates quiet heroines that reflect clarity of thought and so i've always you know gone towards ann elliott eleanor dashwood jane bennett and because they're just kind of quiet. They're not, they're not the Elizabeth Bennets or the Emmas that are taking center stage. And then also the amount of text she devotes to thinking through conflicts. And I think that's really interesting if you go through her books and um, the conversation between Jane Bennett and her sister Elizabeth Bennett on how about um, Charlotte marrying this really stupid fellow and, and and the frustration and, and how Jane has to counsel her sister and say, look, everybody, everybody's different. We're not all the same, you know? I'm trying to get my, okay. Um, Emily Dickinson is, helps me understand the idea of seeing New Englandy. And that comes from a chapter in George uh, Frisbee Witcher's biography called um, This Was a Poet, Emily Dickinson. And he, and, he, and he wrote that in 1930. So it was only about 50 years after she had died. And the, that really helped me understand my ancestry because I am from New England. My ancestors go back to 1630 and, um, and settled in um, New Canaan, Connecticut. And actually that was where I was born. So I've got like you know, hundreds of years of, of roots up there. And it, it helped me understand the type of person I am, that puritanism type of background. I also love um, her metaphysical poetry and how she sees the holiness in the nature. And I just, that's something I always go back to. Um, I, her, her idea of delighting in the craft to make her like sort of a quiet place for herself where she really worked through her poems. I mean, each, she would revise and revise if, if you see some of the, the research on her, her craft making, 
you know, she could, she would spend hours trying to figure out the right word. So um, she's also attended Mount Holyoke Seminary with Mary Lyon. And um, when I first went up to looking at colleges, I saw Mount Holyoke and I was like, oh my gosh, I love this place. And so I, I went to Mount Holyoke College. My father went to Amherst. And so, we're, you know, we, we have those kind of her roots there. And then her line, a hope is a hope is a thing with feathers. That is, I always go back to that line, especially when, you know, getting through these difficult, difficult times. Um, so Elizabeth Bishop is another aspect of my work that I pay a lot of attention to is form. And so I've always, I adore her sestinas, just adore them and try to figure out how did she do that? How does she get a find a form that reflects the content and makes that content really breathe? You know, her poem "One Art" is a villanelle. I've never been able to really write a successful villanelle. I would love to one day, but it's something um, that I I I always keep going back to just because the art of losing it's it's it's. It's like sort of my life, I feel like. It's like you were always losing, we're just losing stuff. And um, so the other um, aspect of her poetry is how she focuses on description. And she's not afraid to let that internal thinking enter a poem. So she kind of, she likes to, you know, reflect on whether she's, um, whether a poem is, is actually saying what she's trying to say and be honest with trying to say that. The other thing that I've always struck me about her was her importance of mentorship, how she really valued Marianne Moore's advice and companionship and also Robert Lowell, all the letters they exchanged and how, how, you know, how much that friendship was uh, valuable to her. My last um, literary influence is Bill Matthews and pretty much it's again the wit and his intellect I always found so inspiring and interesting. His, his love of irony because he too was an ironic uh, poet. Um, but because I knew him personally, I found his kindness and respectful treatment of his students very you know, just made me feel part of the part of his gang, the gang. Um, also, he taught taught me about the gift poem because sometimes you'd be writing so hard, like working, working really hard on a poem, and it was just it was just a bad poem, and it took forever to write a bad poem. But he said, "Don't worry about it. All of this work that's going into this bad poem will show up. Will show up." Um, later as your gift poem. So, um, so that, was, that, was a, a, that was a really nice way, to, something to learn about these, the, the struggle that we go through where everything seems to, seems to be bad, writing bad stuff. And then also, um, I really admire his translations of Homer. Now Homer was um, a lot, uh, you know, a Roman, uh, Roman poet 2000, over 2000 years ago, but he was also into irony and hypocrisy and we'd make social comments on, on what was going on in, in, Ro um, in Rome at that time. So let's see. Okay, so this, this page is sort of just, I'm trying to make a visual illustration about what's, what's happening with my thinking process. I've got my, my literary influences in, this, in the center and this is where I just keep going back. And so if you can imagine like my personal poetry, I'd be you know, having little lines going back and forth, back and forth because my, my, my personal poetry is working off of these influences. <clears throat> and then lately I've noticed that my community poetry, I'm reaching out even farther. So and that so now I'm kind of going back and forth, and you can kind of stitch your way around the circle. And and I'm, I know you're probably finding the same thing yourself: is is your poetry is reaching out farther than than you expected it to. 
Okay, whoops. So I, I've got a, a few, um, so under personal poetry, I'm just gonna kind of go over what the topics are and then I'll read a couple of my community poet, poet, poems so you can sort of see. Um, so here we've got um, Solar System. That is a poem about my cats, okay? I've got a, I mean, that's me. I, I love my cats and I wrote a poem about my cats. In this poem, I'll show you, I'll show you the visual, the, the, the structure of it in a, in a minute, but it, it, is, it is also, um, it, it's also a poem that took me about 10 years to write because I could not find the form of that for that poem. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Pinatas is a poem from that that was the Pushcart nominee poem, and it's in the Comstock Review. I've got um, from fall to 2019. So that and that Pinatas is about my my crazy family. So if you know about Emily Dickinson, she had a crazy family downstairs, and and I was like, Emily, that's that's my house, right? So um, my, my mother is bipolar with delusions and paranoia, and it was a very difficult time growing up. Pinatas is about how sometimes we do mean things because it makes us feel good. Okay, so it kind of struggles with that. The slave owner legacy is um, also my ancestry up my mother's side, but don't tell her, okay. Um, so my slave, and that is something I've had a lot of discussions with Celestine about, about this, you know, how awful, awful it makes me feel to know that and I am descended by, from somebody that was so cruel, you know? And, and so I, I struggle with that. I find, find that very, um, really something that I, I keep going back to trying to figure out what, what, how is that working? Um, the paint chip poem is a response to trying to figure out how to re re respond to my crazy family. How do I do it? And in the paint chip poem, that is includes a, a lot of the line from a, a bishop's one R that just says, write it write it right through that pain, right through all that craziness that's going on in your life. So these, this is sort of my personal side of my poems. And then my community side, you can see on the right side, solar system appears in both sides. The cat poem is about having euthanasia when, when the cat is very sick. And, and I've read it I usually don't read it because it's very sad and depressing, but the, the two times I have read it, people have come up to me after reading it and they said, thank you for reading that. It's helping me heal. Okay, so now I'm kind of going into this community, my community poetry section here. Sweet potato casserole, I'll show you in a minute. This is about my students. I teach English as a second language and they're my students. Um, Price of a Dolce and Cabana basket, I mean jacket, that's um, about when our current president went to Italy and her and the first lady wore a, a jacket that was $50,000, a $50,000 jacket to the, yeah. And then how it seeps into us is a poem. And, and it was interesting during the, during the luncheon, people were talking about um, the, the poems based on art. And so this is, a, this is a poem that comes from, it's from the Cra it one second prize in the Cravens. Um, I'll, I just blanked on the name of the contest, but the art project. And so how it seeps- Arts uh, Festival in New Bern. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, and so I, I wrote a poem on this and, I, and how it seeps into us is about the COVID, um, a response to COVID, so. Um, so I am going to read, a, a, I am, first of all, I'll show you the cat, okay? 
So this form, it had many, many different, it, it started out as one big block poem. And then it's, and then I kind of like, all right, I don't, I don't, this is not working. This block of poetry is not working. And so I was playing around and every, you know, and I was playing around. I thought, let me see what happens if I center it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's a cat. And so I put the, I put it on the page and um, I moved, you know, got it all lined up. So when I read it, the line breaks were in the right place so I could read it easily. And I thought, I'm gonna enter this in a contest. And I thought, there's no way that somebody's gonna pick a cat poem in the shape of a cat for, the, for a winning poem, okay? And it won first prize. So don't give up. Don't say, if somebody says, don't ever write a bird poem, just say, you know, Flip them the bird and say, I'm writing a bird poem, okay? Um, so that was uh, um, the main, that's the, the main thing there with that one. So I am going to, um, I'm going to stop the share a minute and I'm going to read two poems from my community. So this is called How It Seeps Into Us, and it's after the, this night vendor, um, this night vendor photo. So, how it seeps into us. The night vendor lifts up a ream of noodles. Its steam wafts like a bear's breath at night. A man waits in the darkness as the mist reaches its fingers into his hair and clasps his face. When the night vendor comes to me, she leaves her dreams. I'm teaching in a stadium seated classroom. A student gets up to speak to me. He has to leave. He has already lit a cigarette and exhaled it into the room. I look at the smoke floating away from him for yards by the second drag, it has filled a quarter of the room. I tell him to leave immediately, but all I think about is his breath. That one breath transported all that smoke has now permeated the room, our clothes and hair. Two times he exhaled. That was all. We all look at each other. We all know that whatever was inside him is now within each of us, some more, some less. And this is the price of a Dolce and Cabana jacket. The price of a Dolce and Cabana jacket equals $51,000 or for Feeding America backpacks, over 510,000 weekend meals for poor children, or over three times my yearly salary. An Italian coat, which basically says, screw you, America. The video shows the first lady walking through the Cerci Palace in Sicily, not like a butterfly excited by flower beds, but trance-like, covered with lively blossoms. Her style demands flat felled seams precisely measured. The jacket opens straight down the front and flares at her hips, grazing a peach shift. Over a, over a 200, sorry, over 200 twirls of roses, hydrangeas, violets, and geraniums spray across that silk chantung. She smiles as she signs the guest book clutching the matching floral bag as if everything teeters and depends on $1,900 designer heels. Yesterday in church, an arrangement of chrysanthemums, peonies, larkspurs, and dahlias simulated the sanctuary stained glass. People emerged from their coats and shawls, gazing towards that azure gold and lavender bouquet. Their eyes balanced as swallowtails on petals, then looked forward circling pews and choir loft before settling down on the first hymn to freely give their voices. Okay. So um, 
what I'm what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna do one last um, community poem and then we'll go into the the um, the breakout rooms. But oh, let's see. So this is sweet sweet potato casserole. And please excuse my Spanish. I'm still I'm still learning it. Hola, yo soy Melinda Thompson y este es mi poema un casserole de batatas. Mi familia siempre cocina este plato para el día de acción de gracias en los Estados Unidos. Después de ver la película en la mesa de un extraño, yo quise hacer un poema porque mi familia no conoce a las personas que traen las patatas a nuestra mesa. Quiero agradecer a las personas que trabajan mucho en el campo. Este poema describe las palabras para decir gracias a las personas de la agricultura. Ahora yo trato de aprender español con Duolingo porque quiero hablar con ustedes y darle las gracias. Sweet Potato Casserole by Melinda Thompson. Sweet Potato Casserole. One poet says she waits to hear what the words are trying to say. Meanwhile, a documentary shows 50 pounds of yams gathered in one plastic basket, heaved up to a migrant from Chihuahua standing in a school bus. The bus trudges through the turned fields of North Carolina like a taxi with open top and wooden slats for sides, reaping filled baskets. Another poet hopes the best wind finds me ready to wrestle it to the page. As farm workers examine and measure, sweet potatoes lift skyward. Thousands of roots pile up in moving crates, all hand gathered, are waiting for words. Gently, but quickly, these men harvest, and I keep searching for nouns so small, but will swell in the mind to voice the labor and sweat of my Thanksgiving dinner. A friend tells me if you think one person can't make a change, you've never been in bed with a mosquito. Advice swirls like gnats while I peel gams. Their discarded skins, the width of fingers, almost rise as hands to choke my verbs. Still, I dot mashed sweet potatoes with many marshmallows before placing the heavy pan in a 375 degree oven. You can find Sweet Potato Casserole and other poems about North Carolina in the 2020 issue of Cackalack, edited by Ann Kaler, Kimberlyn Blum Highclack, and David Poston. It's a publication of Main Street Rag Publishing Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, so there's the there's the plug for for Cackalack. Um, let's see. I'm going to just go down. Um, so what I'd like to do is to do some breakout rooms, and I. It looks like I, um, maybe Malika or, or Celestine can fix them up for 10 minutes. And I'd like you to think about who is your favorite and why do you keep returning to this poet's craft? And I want you to think about craft. Um, what, um, like both the content and the way they deliver the poems. Um, what poem of his or hers answers Emily Dickinson's quote for you? If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no fire can ever warm me, I know that is poetry. That's gotta be like, 
your go-to poem, right? So that's what what their the poet's going to be does for you. And also, why does this author make you feel less lonely in the world? Because I think we have to consider that. Why do you feel like, oh yeah, this this poet gets me? I get I get that poet. So, um, so that um, if um, so, maybe we could do like. Even if we can't do the breakout rooms, because I can't, don't have the I can do the breakout rooms, huh? I can do the breakout rooms, but I need to know how many of them that you want, and do you want it to be assigned automatically or um, manually? Yeah, instant, like three to four, not more than four. I think it's okay. In I'll, ten minutes, doing four, and. And one would have an extra person. Yeah, I think it could be random, and then the f and then maybe if somebody's. Oh yeah, I'm in. Mean, I get I get to join. All right, so we should see them popping up. So ten minutes. Yeah, ten minutes is is enough. I think. Yeah. All right. So people should be in their rooms. I think.
<clears throat> Turns out we're the only ones here. Everybody else is still, but we can be a breakout room here. Can you hear me? That is funny. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> we're a, yes, we're a break sorry. in room now. Yeah, break in room. <laughs> well, I thought that was 10 minutes. Except now we're being recorded. <laughs> oh, it's not good. <laughs> Well, um, in a way, I sort of um, envy people who have like a mentoring relationship with a poet alive or dead, because mm -hmm. it seems like uh, my biggest influence is whoever I happen to be reading at the moment. And <laughs> yes. uh, so my, my usually habit is to, you know, read one or two books of some contemporary poet over a week or two and, and then move on. But um, but there must be some influencing going on because as I'm reading, I'm thinking, dang, I wish I could do that. So the, the book I just read uh, is this one, Danny Remind Powell. Yeah, in the sunroom with Raymond Carver, okay. Which came out last year and uh, I, I intended to just read it for a few minutes and read a couple of poems and I looked up a couple of hours later and I'd finished the whole book. So I, I wow. really recommend it. I think it's interesting how there are some poets that I start reading and I say, I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand what they're saying. I don't like the words they're using. I, it's like way beyond my, my, my way of thinking. And so I find the poems I like, but I'm reading all, reading as many as I can to determine that. I'm somebody who really loves to hear poems read aloud because it, it gives me a voice. I have I often when I when I have to when I read a poem, I want to hear a voice, and I ha often imagine a voice when I'm just reading text, but it. I love going to a poetry reading where I can actually hear the poet's voice. Mm -hmm. It helps a lot. A long time ago, when I first started writing poetry, I wrote a poem and I ended it in a local contest and I won first prize, which was $50. And I bought the book, um, Poets, The Poet's Voice, and it's a big, big book of poetry. And then there's a, a CD in it with the poems being read by the poets. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really fascinating to hear the poet read their poem. Yeah, I get that out every so often and listen to it. Well, I put together an anthology a few years ago, actually about 20 years ago. Uh, called Poetry Out Loud, and it was all poems that I had picked because they read well out loud. Mm -hmm. And um, then I included little notes and things like that about, you know, how to, how to read them aloud and get, get more out of them and that sort of thing. But, uh, uh, you know, some poems, I mean, it's certainly not the only way to appreciate poetry, um, mm. but uh, I, I just, for me, it just brings them to life. Mm -hmm. So Robert, you like Yeats. Somewhere yeah. on one of these shelves, I have a, a cassette tape of Yeats reading his work. Oh wow! And he uh, sort of in, he sort of in, uh, incanted it when he read. It's like he was yeah, it, speaking it was, a magic spell or something. Right. Sort of. He. It sounds just as crusty as he looks. <laughs> in the chat room. Oh, you didn't hear me. We had, we had a one minute warning, so hopefully um, Aleka is going to bring us all back together here. I think this is the main room. Yeah. Melinda, you're on mute. Oh, am I supposed to say? Oh, so, oh, I'm still in charge, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All yours. Yeah, you're still in charge. 
So we're waiting for everybody to come back to the room, but you might, you know. It's all done. Sorry. Everybody's back. Um, yeah, I, th I thought what we could do is just like to dump some of those in uh, literary inspirations into the chat so we could have a whole list of all the different folks that you were talking about because we had some great discussions in our group and um and i'm just I, and i was and i told my group I, this was my selfish selfishness coming out i really wanted to hear everybody else's inspirations too because it's 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 interesting to like read people's poetry and here's people's poetry when you know who is in the back round yeah. of their of their work it's it's fascinating and i and I know when i um with bill matthews he was he was always um you know, i mean he kept pulling up homer and, um i mean horace all the time and i was like what i need to find out about this horace because i need to know why bill writes the way he does you know Mm. Well, I want to thank you all. I really, I really appreciate the invitation, Celestine, and and I hope you know. I think it's really it, this is really helpful to me too because I haven't really thought about it in that way, but um, and it does influence how I do. I feel like well, some of my writing is not what people would assume that I would write like, and it's just because that's what my influences are. So, uh, is Malika? Oh, there's Malika. Okay, she's here. Uh, so we're going to um, hope you guys think about that, and if you want to um, send a, a, a maybe a line, an email to um, to Linda to let her know how you enjoyed this, and she can put it on a website, and maybe you can recommend uh, certain other things that you might want to learn about. We heard a lot of things here. Laura, I can't hear you. You're muted. We're trying to talk to us. Okay. And um, and so just I just thank you for this, Melinda. It gives us a different way of thinking about things, you know. Um I mean, I really found a lot, I learned a lot about myself by writing up why my in why these influences affected me so strongly. And thank I thank you, Bill. Bill just reminded me of something. I'm sorry. Yeah, Next meeting <laughs> is gonna be in March. March, I think it's March the eleventh. I think that's the second uh saturday in march is that correct yes so it's march the 11th our next meeting be here bring your friends tell your friends There's no and may i remind yeah huh? and may i remind iris and everyone else brockman campbell is open if we have a, a published a book in uh, 2020 please look up the address on the website and please submit and it'll be march the 13th march the 13th, march the 13th. March the 13th. Yeah. thank you so much It'll be on, on Zoom again. Right. <laughs> yes. On, on Zoom again. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Until further notice. <laughs> yeah. Until further notice. Exactly. Is there yeah. is there an ad agenda for the March? Because I'm used to it being in May. The next one being in May. It's always no. March and May. Oh, okay. May is the awards, and March um, is typically we we are planning probably poetry in plain sight readers, but that will be announced closer, probably in February. Okay. It'll be fabulous, whatever it is. Of course. Hey, everybody, take care. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you, Thank you Melinda. Great program. Thanks, Melinda. Melinda. Oh, Thanks, Melinda. Uh, yes, Thank you. Well, um, Okay. Is there a possibility that I could um, get a list of the members? Could you, is there, that something that is that's available? That's not typically that we do. Uh, you're talking about like, now, uh, you mean a list of emails or um, for what yeah. purposes? Yeah. Uh, well, really, I just wanted to contact, uh, be able to contact people by email. We do not do that. Uh, that is a you know private as a private organization. We don't hand out our email for people to pass around their book news and things like that. However, when you announce it in the e-news, it does go out to all of our uh, members. So that's how we do that. So Peggy, what I would suggest is um, getting up with Linda Rush Myers, who runs the monthly e-news, and that way you can announce it and people can know um, and celebrate with you. 
Um, actually, it was it's Linda that I was wanting to contact. <laughs> okay, well then, her email is available on the website. Okay, um, and that's what you know. All the board members are listed, so that's easy peasy. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, be well, everybody. Bye bye. Yes, thanks, right. Malika. Thanks, bye. thanks, boss. Thank you, boss. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. This is the great. Boss now. <laughs> Bye, Bill. Oh, no, not Bye, yet. Guys. Not yet. Oh, yeah, no. Two more meetings. <laughs> All right, guys. I don't know what the command on. is to save the chat. You know how to, what did you push for that? Um, I actually, uh, the, the chat, um, yeah, the, I'm not sure, Rob. The best way to do that would probably be copy and paste. That's what I've done. Um, I'll give you a minute to do that and let, let me stop.